have invited us to come. You've reassured us with your love. And as a family, cherishing your presence, Lord, we boldly of your word. We come to understand your word. In humble majesty revealing in the face of Christ your glory God. As I Spirit through your grace, you're transforming us in the image of the heavenly man, your sovereign plan. As I
with our lamps trimmed and filled with oil, Lord God. Lord, would you do that work in our heart, Lord? Lord, would you teach us by your word, Lord, through your Holy Spirit today, Lord? Lord, would you mold us and make us and change us to be more like Jesus? Lord, may we leave this place, Lord, not just full of chili, but filled with your spirit, Lord God. Changed because we've met with you and we fellowship with those that love you, Lord. And may we be ready to go out into the mission fields, Lord, that you've placed us, Lord. And we thank you, Lord. Receive our worship, Lord. Receive our praise. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. At this time, would you stand for the reading of God's word? At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread? 
which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord, even of the Sabbath. Now, when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue, and behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, that they might accuse him? Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. Thank you. Thank you very much. This time we'd like to dismiss the children to their Sunday school. Remind the youth you'll be in with us for fellowship. And sing one more song and Pastor Bob will come. Please remain standing. You are the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord was high. Your hand in glory and creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. Yeah.
Lord, we thank You for this opportunity. We thank You for the presence of Your Holy Spirit, Spirit here with us today. And Lord, we pray, and Lord, we pray that You now bless the teaching of the Word as we come to it. Administer it to our hearts and our lives, Lord, for we need it. We need it desperately in our lives, and especially in the day and the culture in which we live in. Lord, we need that sure foundation. We need that light to our paths, and we need that guidance, Lord, to our feet that we might be able to go the way in which we should. Lord, bless us now as we give thanks to you for your word, and we ask all this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. You may be seated, and uh, I'm hoping that you're there already, Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. You see that we're doing things a little different. For those of you who are new, visiting today, you wouldn't know any difference. You think, oh, that's the way they do it every week, but actually for years we have been doing it where we start out uh, with the reading of the psalm, uh, and then the announcements, greetings, and then we go into worship. And uh, just since the Lord telling us it was time to shake things up a little bit, we, it was our third time through the Psalms. There's 150 Psalms. Some of them we had to break up into as many as five weeks. So that tells you how long that we've been reading the Psalms every Sunday morning. And the Psalms are great, and I love them. And it's not that they get old or redundant, uh, but uh, I just felt like the Lord was saying that it was good uh, to get the children involved with our service. So we're going to each Sunday, uh, one of the children is going to read my text that I'm going to be teaching on. Uh, and uh, I hope it blesses your heart like it blesses mine. And uh, I'm really looking forward to what the Lord is going to do with all that. All right. So we come to chapter 12 of Matthew. In the conclusion of chapter 11, Jesus said this. He says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. This is a Sabbath statement that he gave us there. Because Jesus gave, or God gave the Jews the, the Sabbath so that they could rest. We find that in chapter 16, that as they were in the wilderness... And as God was providing for them daily the manna that they needed to survive, the Lord told them that he had created in six days and on the seventh that he had rest. And so they were to gather manna for six days and then on the seventh they were to rest. And if they tried to get more during the week than a day's portion, what would happen is overnight it would just simply putrefy. So they couldn't get away with it. You know, and we're like that. We're always trying to, you know, kind of go around what God's plans are for us and do the things the way that we want to do them instead of the way that God wants us to. There was a lesson that was there for them, and a very good one, and one that God wanted to demonstrate through his people that they were definitely a called people. They were different in the cultures that were around them. You understand that in the cultures that were around them, they worked seven days a week. You know, it, it's where we are today. We work seven days a week. Everything that we want or need can be found 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As a young man growing up, I can tell you that wasn't always the case. I actually lived in a community in sun, uh, Southern California to where it was a Sabbath city that on Sundays you could not do business. The only ones that were allowed to be open were, was the drive through dairy, and the only things that you could purchase were eggs, milk, butter, and bacon. That was it. They didn't want you to miss out on Sunday morning breakfast, I'm sure. Maybe that's why I grew up on that, you know, and that's what I ate all the time, was because of that. But nonetheless, the whole community shut down for Sunday. Nobody bought and sold or anything. There were things that went on that reminded me that there was a God, even though I didn't even know that God. Church bells that I heard on Sunday morning. Because you know how you could hear them? It's because there wasn't any traffic. It was quiet in the community. And so you heard those church bells ringing, and what those church bells said was, there was a God. Even to a young boy like myself who did not know him, I remember those days after I came to Christ I remember that, that very strong emphasis and message that was made in those things. This is what was for the nation of Israel too. 
to those who are around them. Because God says, I want you to work six days and you're going to take one day off. Now, it wasn't necessarily a day so that they could go out and party and, and, you know, do all kinds of wild and crazy things. It was set aside so that they could rest from their labors, but so that they could worship God. That was the intention of it. You know, we're spoiled in our culture in our times where not only do we get one day off, we get two. We get Saturday and Sunday off. And so we've grown into that culture that says, well, I got two days off, and that's for me, and the five days I work for my employer. And there's little time for God in that, especially within our culture as a whole. And sadly to say, much of it is within the church too. We see Sunday as, as a day that we go and we do our duty. We go to church. We listen to some fuzzy guys say a bunch of things about the Bible. And then we go home and we do whatever we want to. We party. We do all kinds of stuff. Rather than it being a day that is set aside for the worship of the Lord. To relax. To, to refresh yourselves. And it's just become another day that we do a lot of different things. And I, I don't know, I'm not going to try to lay some trip on you uh, and telling you that you have to obey the Sabbath or something like that because that was the problem that the Jews had in Jesus' day. They misrepresented what the Sabbath was. It was that day of rest, but it is to rest from the labors that you do so that you can focus on the Lord. That's what the intent of the Sabbath was. You see, God knew what was best for us. Uh, you know, here's the truth. Uh, men who own companies could care less whether or not you have a day of rest as long as they can get the production from you that they need and want. And uh, the laws that we have to where we have these kind of things within our culture are not because of kind-hearted, good people who wanted to treat their employees really well. It's because it was forced upon them. It was thrust upon them. And that's because at one time we were a nation that really did observe the Sabbath, but on Sunday, not on Saturday. But then employers got to where they required more and more and more, and Sabbath became, the Sunday worship became less and less important. And finally, the people got tired of it, and they began to pay, uh, pass labor laws requiring that there was a certain amount of hours that a person had to have off each week. So, anyways... The Jews, they were given this wonderful Sabbath that they might have rest. And the Lord was going to use that within them. But at this time, many of the rabbis filled Judaism with elaborate rituals related to the Sabbath and the observance of other laws. And we'll see that as we're going through our text this morning as they criticize the disciples for grabbing heads of grain and taking them off plucking them off, rubbing them in their hands, getting, away, getting rid of the chaff, and then eating the grain because they had distorted what was work on the Sabbath. Just to give you some examples uh, of that whole thing, in the Talmud, which is the commentary on the law that the Jews wrote, you know, explaining about these different things, there are 24 chapters dedicated to the interpretation of what the Sabbath is. 24 chapters for one little verse, okay? And then what they began to do was to define what that was. Ancient rabbis taught that on the Sabbath, a man could not carry something in his right hand or in his left hand, across his chest or on his shoulders. But he could carry something with the back of his hand, with his foot, elbow, or in the ear, on the hair, in the hem of his shirt, or in his shoe or sandal on the Sabbath the, on, on the Sabbath one was forbidden to tie a knot except a woman could tie a knot in her girdle so if a bucket of water had to be raised from a well one could tie a rope to the bucket but a woman could, uh, could not tie a, a rope to the bucket but a woman could tie her girdle to the bucket and then to the rope and bring it up Women, oh, you guys are going to love this. Women were forbidden to look into what was at their time a, a looking glass or a mirror because they might see a white hair 
or a great hair and they would be tempted to pluck it out so a woman was not allowed to look in a mirror we don't have that problem today we have bottles of hair dye so it's not a problem right Otherwise, I guess maybe we'd be stuck with that too. But, you know, what I'm sharing with you is how ridiculous they made the sabbatical, the sabbatical law. But yet, if they wanted to accomplish something, they would take and they would twist things so that they were unable to do so. If they wanted to do something on the Sabbath, such as journey, take a journey. Now, they were not allowed to go more than what is referred to as a Sabbath day's journey, which is about a half a mile. That, that's the farthest they could go. But if you had to go further than that, here's what you needed to do. You had to set up a temporary dwelling place. And if you would travel this distance and set up that temporary dwelling, then when you left that temporary dwelling, you could go another of the same distance with another dwelling there and, and so on and so forth until you could get to wherever you needed to go on the Sabbath. And, and that's what happens with rules, regulations, and laws. Is that when we look at those as being something that's going to give us righteousness and relationship with God, then what happens is we begin to twist those to whatever we want them to be in order to give us the advantage to do whatever we want to do. You know, it's it very few conform to it it, it's more that they transform to it and, and they make it into something that they can work with. When God's intention was not to give them more burden, as a matter of fact, like I said in chapter 12, you know, Jesus says there, he says, come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. That's what it was intended. Jesus is telling them, I am your Sabbath. I'm your Sabbath rest. That's where we find rest is in him. Rest from what? Well, it, we rest from that trying to obtain righteousness through our good works and relationship with God through those things. We rest completely from that. There's nothing that we can do. We come to Christ. We give our heart and life to Christ and we find peace and we find rest for our soul, for our very heart in him. But it translates uh, more than that too because he says that if, if we are weary and heavy laden, if we are burdened. So in other words, it's, it's not just that I rest from works trying to obtain righteousness through the keeping of those, those things, but I also have this relationship with Christ now that as I am troubled by the things that are going on in my life, that I can come to him and lay them on him and he will give me rest. He'll take that burden from me and he'll take and he'll put his yoke, his burden on me, which are light and they are easy. I don't know about you guys, but the world that we live in today, it just seems like it's constantly dumping upon us always putting more and more and more and more upon us. Some of it is self-inflicted because we receive that upon ourselves and we think that we have to live up to this or that or do this or have this or have that. You know, that, that this is what the measure of success is. This is what the measure is of that I have enough, which if you read Solomon's books, uh, you know, Ecclesiastes, uh, you, you find that that's not the case, that there's never enough. And it's like, uh, I can't remember which one of the rich guys it was that, that said it, but they asked him, how much is enough? And he said, just a little bit more. And he was, you know, one of the richest men in the world at that time. Just a little bit more. And it doesn't matter if you're the richest man in the world or you're the poorest man in the world. How much is enough? Just a little bit more. You know? One more Harley. I need, I need three instead of two. Right? No, I don't. That's a, that was a kind of a rhetorical question. So, verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. You see, now Jesus shows us the kind of heavy burdens 
and hard yokes that the religious leaders had put upon the people. When the disciples began to pluck the heads of grain in the eyes of the religious leaders, they were guilty of reaping, threshing, winnowing, and preparing food. All of those things were forbidden by the Jews to do on the Sabbath. And so they said, your, your men are guilty of all of this. I mean, the first thing that comes to my mind is, how did those guys get out there to those grain fields in order to witness this, with this whole thing about a Sabbath day's journey? How did they get out there? Uh, maybe they were breaking their own Sabbath laws. I think so. I think so. And that's typically how it goes when somebody holds those kind of things over a people. They rarely find themselves subjecting themselves to the same laws that they subject others. They find and say that they are an exception to the rule. This represented, this represented the four, four violations of the Sabbath in one mouthful. In one mouthful. Four things. But here's the thing. There was nothing wrong with what they did because their gleaning was not considered stealing. Uh, according to Deuteronomy chapter, 20, chapter 23, verse 25, the issue was only the day on which they did it. Which they did it. The rabbis made an elaborate list of do and don'ts, don't items relevant to the Sabbath, and this violated several, several, uh, several, several items on their list. The law of Israel allowed people traveling through an area to glean enough grain for a small meal from fields in the area. Farmers were commanded not to completely harvest their crops, uh, to leave a little behind for the sake of travelers and for the poor. Even to the degree that if you had your sheaves all gathered up and you're taking them out uh, over to the threshing floor and you forget one, you leave it there, you weren't to go back to get it. You were supposed to leave it there for others who would come. So it, there was nothing wrong with the practice of what the, the disciples had done. They weren't being thieves. They weren't doing anything wrong whatsoever. And Jesus is going to give them two examples to show them how their view is flawed with what they were saying that, that they had done and what was wrong with that. In verse 3, he says, But he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God and he ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priest. So the first example that Jesus gives them is their beloved King David. Now, David, even still to this day, within Judaism, is held in high regard because of what God says about David, that David was a man after his own heart. But if you look at his life, you got to wonder how those who were so steeped in keeping the law and righteousness could find it in their hearts to forgive such a man who was an adulterer, a murderer, you know, and a liar, you know, and all those things that are becoming quickly acceptable within our culture as being perfectly okay. But it didn't used to be that way. It used to be that all those things were bad and wrong, and we didn't like that when somebody would do that, and we'd call that out. But today, it's becoming quite acceptable within our culture, and unfortunately, quite acceptable within the church, too. And we need to understand that those things are not. But nonetheless, he brings up David, which they absolutely love. And, and, and nobody criticized David when he did that. You know, they saw that as being God working in David and him needing it and that God was providing for him. He broke the law for the need of his men. And this was the thing that was critical, I think, that Jesus is trying to show us here. That there is a law that God says that they were to obey the Sabbath. Now, let me back up just a little bit because we need to understand the Sabbath is given to the Jews and to the Jews only. It's not for Gentiles and it's not for Christians either one. And there's actually been denominations that have started on the whole idea that we need to be Sabbatarians, that we need to worship on Saturday. And to be honest with you, in my opinion, they just haven't thought it through. If you look at the first century church, which was comprised mainly of Jews, and there were two things that they did. They went to the synagogue and to the temple to worship on Saturday, and then they gathered together to worship Jesus Christ on Sunday, which was the day that he rose from the dead. And there are those who practice Sabbath worship, and I'm perfectly okay with that if that's what they want to do. 
But don't try to lay on me that it's something that I have to do because the Word doesn't tell me that at all. And it wasn't the practice of the first church. The first church met on both days. So if, I guess if you really want to stick close to the Word, then let's get together and have church service on Saturday and Sunday. Okay? We can do that. Matter of fact, sounds good. Maybe we should. Nonetheless, Paul, in Romans 14, I believe it is, he says that, that, that some regard one day as better than the other, and some regard the other day as better than the other, but the truth is all days are the same. The only thing that matters is that you worship the Lord, and it doesn't matter what day it's on. We choose Sunday because it is the day on which Christ rose, and it's been the practice of the church for thousands of years, and I think it's a good one, and so we continue to do that. But the truth is that for us, as New Testament believers, we shouldn't limit it to just Sunday, or even just Sunday morning, or even Sunday morning, Sunday night. The truth is, is that our worship of the Lord should be every day of the week. You remember what I said about the practice of the Sabbath for the Jews, and especially in the provision in the wilderness when it came to the manna? And it was that they had to depend upon the Lord each and every day to provide for their need. You know, that's a principle for New Testament believers too, in the fact that Jesus supplies for our needs each and every day. Whether you recognize it, whether you acknowledge it or not, it's the truth. You know, what is it that they say that all of us are like two weeks away from being homeless? We're two paychecks away, I guess, from being homeless. And, and that's pretty much the truth for 90% of the people in the United States, that if they had to go without income for a month, they would find themselves out on the street. They wouldn't be able to pay their mortgage, wouldn't be able to eat, they wouldn't be able to pay their bills. Part of that is, is because we have so much debt, you know, that we couldn't live on a little, we have to have a lot. But nonetheless, the point is, is that God provides for us. And any time that that job would be to go away, it strikes fear into our hearts, right? Because that's the, that's the means by which God is providing for me. But do I acknowledge that each and every day of my life? Do I, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the job that I have. Thank you for the income that I have because it could all go away so quickly. Then where would I be? Well, I'd be right in the place where I was trusting the Lord. And that's where God wants us to be. He wants us to be in that relationship with him. And this comes back to the whole idea of Sabbath rest. It's the relationship with God through Jesus Christ, trusting in him each and every day of our weeks, not just one day, not just a couple of hours, but each and every day of the week of our life. And sometimes that lesson is hard learned, but it's only because we would resist him rather than acknowledging that and saying, Lord, you know, help me, help me to be in mind of how much you are in control of my life and all the things that you're doing in my life that I benefit from, that I, that I am blessed by, and that we acknowledge that to the Lord in a heart of gratefulness and thankfulness. You know, the whole idea of count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what great things that God has done. You know, if, if you sit down and you start enumerating those things, and if you really put yourself before the Lord and say, God, open my eyes, open my heart, show me all those things that I might give you thanks for it, you'll probably be sitting there for three hours just thanking God for what he has done and sometimes for what he hasn't done, right? Thank God he didn't let me win that stinking publisher's clearinghouse again. I had it all spent. I knew what I was going to do, but it didn't come through. Thank you, Lord, because I realized in all that, I had very little in that with you. Most of it was on me. Just kidding. I would probably give most of that away. I say most because I would make sure that I was comfortable. Right? Isn't that way we look for that? So, 
Jesus is telling him, telling them that there's something that is much more important than this law of the Sabbath. And, and it's the law, and we'll see it here in just a moment uh, in verse 7 where it is mentioned, where he says that I desire mercy and not sacrifice. You see, it's that there's, there is a law, yes, that's here for the Sabbath, but this is what is important, is that people and their needs will supersede that law. You know, and he uses David as that example. It wasn't lawful for David to do what he did, but there was a need that was there. He was already anointed as king. He was running from Saul, and and we needed to save his life. We needed to have him in that place where everything was being provided for him. And so, therefore, it was acceptable. It was acceptable to them, too, and rightfully so. But he's pointing this out to them so that they understand. And then his next example is given to us in verse 5. He says, Or have you not read in the law that the Sabbath, that on the Sabbath, the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? You see, for the, pri- for the, the priest, for the sake of those that come to worship, broke the Sabbath by carrying wood uh, for the altar and for offering up the sacrifice and bringing water to the bronze laver for washing and cleansing and all those kind of things. Saturday was a day for them to work. So they took a different day off. I can relate to this. I work on Sunday, although I like my job a lot, and I wonder why I get to do it. Uh, but still, I love it a lot, and it's great. But don't kid yourself, it's work. And every time we get away, my wife and I, when we get away somewhere, one of the things we love to do, boy, we find a church somewhere to where we come in and we just kind of sit there and we're just really kind of incognito. You see, I don't look like a pastor, so nobody accuses me of being one when I get there. And I can just sit there and enjoy the worship and the teaching of the word and receive and I don't have to go, okay, let's see, who, what's coming up next? What's going, da, 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 going through the list? I can just relax and have a good time. I do relax here to some degree, and I do enjoy our worship, and I do worship the Lord. But I know that, bottom line, there's going to be a time that I'm going to come up here, not have to get up here. I'm going to come up here, and I have, to be, I have to be attuned to the cue that it's time for me to come up. Pastor Paul, he gives me this little secret handshake, you know, so that I know I got to come up. You know? I don't want to tell you what it is because then you'd spot it and you oh, Pastor Bob's going up there now. We like the element of surprise. So he points out to them that the very ones that, that were in that arena, the same arena as the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the, those who were the scribes, those who were the keepers of the law, they worked on the Sabbath. And that was perfectly okay with God. It was perfectly okay with God, and it needed to be perfectly okay with them. It, well, it was, because they understood this is what you remember for the Levites, for those who served the priest, that was their inheritance. They had no promise of the land their promise was the Lord. They got to serve the Lord. And so they realized that they were getting what, what God was, you know, offering them and giving to them. And so they had no problem with working on the Sabbath. But by golly, you know, I got to tell you this, one of the things I didn't mention, that you could not carry any burden. So if you had false teeth, any, any burden over what was it, four ounces or something like that, uh, that meant that if you had false teeth, you couldn't wear them on the Sabbath because you would be carrying a burden. Isn't that silly? You know, but that happens, doesn't it? Anytime we start trying to make something out of God's word and what God wants that's not there and it's not what God desires, then it becomes like that. It becomes silly. And you see people do ridiculous things. You know, there, there are other organizations. I'm not going to call them Christian because they're a cult. But they, they have a particular dress code that every, everybody's expected to wear. And one of those is that men should not have facial hair. Isn't that great? So when I went to one of their events, uh, it's a long story and I don't want to get into it right now. Uh, but one of the things that was very obvious is that I was the only man in the whole building that had facial hair. 
They didn't have mustaches. They didn't have beards. They didn't have anything. Because it's their rules that men should not have beards. Now, I'm not exactly sure where they get that, but they claim to get it from the scripture and so on and so forth, and that's fine. But, man, I'm telling you, I'm glad that I have the rest of Christ and that I don't have to worry about that because I hate shaving. That, if that's not obvious, if, if, if that's not obvious, you need to take another look, right? But, nonetheless, they're just rules that people get caught up in that are unnecessary because they're not found within the Scriptures. And so Jesus points them towards the priests so that they understand that even though there, there is that Sabbath law, that for the sake of others, the priest had an obligation to minister to those who would come in to worship God. That without them, you know, you understand, without them, for everybody to come, they would not be able to worship God in the way that God prescribed. And the offering of their sacrifices, that they would bring them to the priest and they would offer them up, up to the Lord. And, you know, that, that when the leper, when we saw the leper earlier on, and how when Jesus clean, cleansed him, that one of the things he had to do is go to the priest so that they could offer up what was prescribed in the Old Testament. This is always interesting to me. In the Old Testament, made, God made provision for what a man was to do when he was healed of leprosy, but yet there were none that were healed of leprosy except for what we see in the New Testament, excluding Haman, who was not a Jew, who was healed. Other than that, it's the only, uh, well, and Deborah, who had leprosy and then was, was or not Deborah, I'm sorry. Miriam. Miriam, thank you, who was healed of her leprosy. Other than that, we don't have any other accounts of people that were lepers getting healed and coming to the priest and making their sacrifice, but God made sure that when it did happen that there was provision what was to be done, and that was the offering up of sacrifices for that very reason. Without the Levites, that would not be possible. And so Jesus points to them. Look, he says, Look at, look at your own surroundings. Look at what's going on. Look at your own history. Look what's taking place and understand God's intent toward the Sabbath. And then he makes this statement. He says, yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. Oh boy, this is a heavy statement that Jesus makes here and it's actually a, a, a statement attesting to his deity. And when he says that he is greater than the temple here, in just a moment, he's going to say that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. Okay, both of those things were things that the Jews held in very high esteem. And Jesus is saying, guess what? I'm, I'm the one that has authority and control over all that. Well, of course, we'll see by the time we get to verse 14 that it's going to incense them so much that they're going to strike out at that point in time against Jesus to try to destroy him because of the statements that he's making. Verse 7, he said, but, I, but if you had known what this means, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. The reference to the passage, I desire mercy and not sacrifices, Hosea chapter 6 and verse 6. And the Pharisees' lack of understanding of this principle was also a way that Jesus questioned the confidence the Pharisees had in their man-made traditions. You remember, I told you how many pages that they had in the Talmud over this one little verse about keeping the Sabbath. They just wrote volumes on it. They used those traditions to justify lifting principles like sacrifice above principles like mercy when God would have them do just the opposite. Jesus showed them that God is more concerned with the needs of people than the keeping of the law. Matthew Poole had this to say. He said, where two laws in respect of some circumstance seem to clash one with another, so as we cannot obey both, our obedience is due to that which is the more excellent law. The more, more excellent law is the law of mercy. When you look through the scriptures, one of the things, one of the attributes of God is that he is mercy and he is merciful. And as a matter of fact, he tells us over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament that what he desires is to give mercy. 
We see that in its fulfill, fulfillment in the extension of his love through his son, Jesus Christ, upon a cross. That was, here, I want to give mercy to a sinful world. And the only way I can do that is through my son who will die for the sins of the world so that mercy can come. Otherwise, judgment must come. But God loves mercy. And he desires that all would come to mercy. Not just the initial calling out to the Lord for our salvation, but also invoking mercy upon our lives daily. Right? Because his mercy is new every morning. It's an old thing I say, but it's, it, it's still just as true. And that is that he gives mercy every day because we use our portion up the day before. We need a new portion of mercy each and every day. And I'm so grateful to God that, that I know this about him, that his desire is always to give me mercy in my life. When I mess up, that's all he says. Come to me, confess, repent, receive mercy. You know, I can stay off in the corner and say, no, I don't want to do that. I want to beat myself with a whip and feel bad about all the things I do. Or I can come to him and put it before him and receive the mercy of God. All my imperfections come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my burden is light and my yoke is easy, and I will give you rest for your souls. This is what Jesus is telling us here, even through these things. Verse 8, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Like I said, this is a statement of his deity. God's dwelling place was the temple and the Jews worshiped the temple almost more than God of the temple they held it up in such high regard it was almost equal to the God that inhabited the temple and that's why later on we will see as uh, Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees that he's going to tell them that if you destroy this temple in three days I will raise it up and how and incense them one, that he would even think about destroying it, and two, that he would be able to build it in three days because it was a monolith that they had created to God, and so therefore, impossible. All of these would lead eventually in their seeking after him in order to kill him, uh, to destroy him for the things that he claimed to be, even this one here. Verse 9, now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue. One of the things that I see here, which is uh, comforting to me, is that we see that even though there was nothing that Jesus could learn by going to the synagogue, you realize that, right? There's nothing, nothing he could learn. But he still would go to synagogue. He would always go there. And he would minister to the people and he would be a part of it. And I love that about the Lord because I think sometimes we can think that, that going to worship is something that we can live without. I don't really need that. I've heard that fuzzy pastor say those same things so many times. I can almost speak his sermon before he does. He just repeats himself often. If I do, it's because the Holy Spirit wants you to hear it again. You didn't hear it the first time. That's my opinion, and you can disagree, but still, but still, the Lord is good in repeating himself to us. And if Jesus, if it was good enough for Jesus to go to worship, then we should take that to heart within our own hearts as well. And behold, there was a man, verse 10, who had a withered hand, and they asked him, saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? This shows their unwillingness to hear what Jesus was trying to teach them about the Sabbath. Those other things that he had already spoken to them about and showing them the examples of God's mercy and how much he desired mercy over sacrifice and how important that was, it just went right over the top of their heads. You know what? By this time, they had been stopping their ears to hear what the Holy Spirit had to say. Verse 10. Uh, I already read that, but this shows their unwillingness to hear. Then he said in verse 11, sorry. Then he said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath and you will not lay hold of, uh, lift it out? 
of how much more value than is a man than a sheep. Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. He appeals to their own lifestyle. He had showed them it, it, from the examples of the past with David, the present, with the worshiping uh, of the Levites in the, in the temple, doing work on the Sabbath. And then, he appeal, and then he appeals even to, if you will, the things that are done out of sight. Right? Because this guy's got sheep. He's got one that falls into a ditch. What's he going to do? Well, he's not going to let it die there because of the sake of the Sabbath. He's going to drag it out for the sake of the sheep. And Jesus says, if you'll do that for a sheep, how much more important is a man? Well, in our culture today, probably not a lot. Right? Animals are more important than what human beings are. And it's becoming more and more obvious. It, uh, I've got a very short period of time, so I don't want to get too far off track here. But, you know, here's the thing. I see these ads now that for $19 a month, you can support an animal shelter and that you can you know make sure that all these dogs are getting and they show some of the most miserable scroungy skanky dogs and cats that you can possibly see to tug on the heart so that you will give nineteen dollars a month you know that there used to be an organization that used to do that for orphans they would they would do that and then as far as i know it was, um, it was a christian relief fund i think is what it was that used to do that um and it I've never heard anything about them that they've gone wrong, but I don't see their advertisements on TV anymore. But now they've taken it over to spare the life of dogs and cats when we're killing millions of babies every year. Do you think that they would allow the pregnancy center to put an ad on the TV that says for $19 a month, you can help support a woman who has chosen to give life to a child to help take care of her medical, her housing, and her needs for employment and those kind of things. Just $19 a month. If you'll just support that, we'll be able to do this for who knows how many girls. No, they won't allow that. But it shows the heart of our culture, our society, that is found in Romans chapter 1 where it says that men begin to wor worship the creature re rather than the creator. And uh, we're seeing that more and more and more. Sheep are not as important as human beings. I don't care what they say. And Jesus is making that point here too. He says sheep are important because that's their livelihood, this is what they eat, this is how they get wool, all those kind of things. He's not saying sheep aren't important. And I'm not saying that animals aren't important either. But he is saying that a human being is much more important to God than that sheep. The sheep doesn't have a soul. The man does. And so then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and he was restored as, as whole as the other. We don't know how long this man's hand had been withered, nor do we know the cause. We just know that Jesus told him to do that which he could not do. Stretch out his hand. Okay, his hand was withered. That means his hand was drawn back like this. He couldn't straighten out his arm. He couldn't put his hand out there. For how long? We don't know. We don't know if he was born that way. That we don't know if there was an accident that happened that caused this in his life. You know, for many people, Jews of their day, seeing someone like that, they would assume it was because there was sin in their life that they were suffering such a fate. We don't know. All we know is this. Jesus told him to do that which he had not been able to do. Stretch out your hand. And in faith and obedience, he did so, and it was restored as whole as the other. You understand that it really it took an act of faith. He didn't say, I can't do that. I haven't been able to do that for years. Jesus said, stretch out your hand. He trusted in what Jesus said, and he just reached out. He stretched out his, out his hand. And as he took that act of faith, as he was obedient to the word of Christ, what happened? His hand was healed. You see, and there's a great principle there for you and I as well. It doesn't matter what's going on in our life. It doesn't matter what has crippled us. It doesn't matter what we're struggling with. It doesn't matter how difficult it is. Jesus says, stretch out your hand. And when you do, in faith, and you believe God in his word, guess what he's going to do? He's going to heal you. He's going to deliver you. He's going to strengthen you. 
He's going to fill you with His Holy Spirit and make you whole. That's His promise. Not mine, but His. What do you think would have happened had He not been obedient and stretched out His hand? Well, we don't know that for sure, but I presume that it probably wouldn't have been healed. There was something there that that Jesus wanted to demonstrate and to show. You see, Jesus' command becomes the power and the enablement to do it. It is the promise of the power to fulfill as we trust him and we look to him. That means that whatever we're going through, that if we'll trust God, that he will be able to bring us through victorious on the other side. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy him. The clear teaching and the miraculous examples were not enough to turn their heart toward God. Jesus had spoken to them. He had showed them. And he demonstrated his power, his authority. He told them of his power and his authority. And then he showed them what power he had by telling that man to stretch out his hand and healing his hand in spite of what they believed and thought of the Sabbath. Jesus wasn't doing this to say, nah, 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 in your face. He's He's trying to show them, look, you're wrong. Look at what I'm doing. Let me show you the power, the authority that I have that you might believe in me. That you might believe in God and the one whom he had sent, his son, Jesus Christ. Even though he had done all that, they had hardened their hearts, they'd stopped their ears, that they could not hear nor receive the truth of God and his word. They had brought this upon themselves. You know, I, I, I believe that if, if God was to do such a miracle in front of us today, in front of this church, that it would astound us. And it would probably bolster your faith in Christ as you saw the power of God touch somebody and heal him physically. But, and I mean, I would not limit God to, to doing, uh, you know, that he could not or would not do that. He can. And I would pray that he would. But the truth is, is we have his written word and all we need to do is look to that and trust it and believe it. And we too can see the healing within our own heart. Whether it's physical or not, it doesn't matter. It's emotional, um, in our mind, mental, all these different things. God is willing to touch even all of us. You see, the question for us today is, are we listening to what God has to say to us? Or are we like them in hardening our hearts and stopping our ears because we don't want to receive the truth and we don't want to obey? So we make our own interpretations of God's word to suit our own desires. A lot of times, a lot of times, not always, but many times, people do that. They take and they interpret God's word the way that they want to interpret it so that they can continue to do what they're doing so that they ease their conscience. But yet, God's word says something else very plainly and very clearly. That's what, did, that's what the Pharisees did. They twisted God's word. They interpreted it differently than what God had intended it to be. And in so doing, they laid heavy burdens upon people you got to do this. you got to do that. You can't do this. You can't do that. When Jesus says, through Paul, all things are lawful, but not all things are profitable. Not all things are expedient to us. We may be able to do different things, but you have to judge in your own mind and your heart whether or not it's really profitable in your life to do those things. And we don't get into that. We can't. We don't. We shouldn't. We couldn't. That kind of thing. There's only one command that I see that God really gives us, and that is to love him with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. That's what God says to us. Do that. You know what? If you're busy doing that, I'll guarantee you won't have to worry about the Decalogue, you know, the Ten Commandments. By the way, all the Ten Commandments, except for the one about the Sabbath, is repeated in the New Testament. All of them. They're there. So if you think it's an archaic group of Scripture that we don't have to pay any attention to, I would challenge you to look it up in the New Testament where it cross-references to that, and you'll find that it is important to us today in our life. Don't twist God's Word to your liking 
Don't twist God's word to your desires. Take God's word, apply it to your heart. Open up your ears, open up your heart today and hear what God has to say. Will you bow your hearts with me? Father, we thank you and we praise you for your word. And I pray, God, that you would continue to minister by your Holy Spirit to our hearts and lives. Lord, we need you so desperately to show us the way in which we should go. We need you to strengthen us. We need you to give us the faith to stretch out our hand. Not only that, Lord, that as we do, that we would receive the empowering to accomplish it and the healing that comes with it as we do. Lord, as we come to your communion table this day, a place of remembrance of the work which you had done, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for this table. And Lord, we want to bring all this before you now and ask you, Lord, to bless us as we celebrate you in Jesus' name. Amen. Before I ask the Lord to bless the bread, um, how many of you have never been to a Christian Seder? A Christian Seder. You've never been to a Christian Seder. How many? Okay, so if you don't know what it is, you definitely haven't been to one. Okay, that's the whole thing. Well, we're going to see what a Seder is here this morning as we look into Matthew's Gospel chapter 26. It's referred to as the Last Supper, the Passover. And what Jesus is celebrating with his disciples is something that the Jews celebrated from the time they went in, out, in, through the, out of the wilderness. They didn't have their first Passover until they entered into the Promised Land. 
And what this is, it's a recognition, a remembrance of what God did in Israel in delivering them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And, and so that's what this is all about. You remember that in Exodus, they were told to take a lamb and bring it in the house and slaughter it. And they were to take the blood of the lamb and they, they were to put it on the doorpost outside the, the door. And that way, when the angel of death came, because the last plague in Egypt was the death of the firstborn. And the firstborn everywhere in the land was gonna die unless the blood of the lamb was over the doorpost and down the lentil. And so because of that, they were spared. And so God told them, when you come out, what I want you to do is I want you to remember. I want you to remember your time in Egypt. I want you to remember how my hand was upon you. And I want you to remember how you were delivered and how the blood of the lamb is what's providing the sacrifice for your sins. Of their day, it was through that that atonement for their sins took place. The problem was is it had to be done every year. Year after year after year after year after year. And it had to be done often as well. And then Jesus came. And he's going to tell the guys, he said, look, man. He says, I'm the Lamb of God. I'm the one that's going to take away the sins of the world. And it's once for all. It's not every year. It's not over and over and over again that Jesus has to be sacrificed. He was sacrificed once. And then he was placed in a grave. And he lay there for three days. And on the third day, he rose from the dead, having victory over sin and death. And after the Feast of Weeks, which comes after Pentecost, he then ascended to heaven to the right hand of the Father where he sits, ever living to make intercession for you and I. That's the gospel. That's the truth. That's the good news. Because when we recognize that we're sinners and that we needed a Savior, and we accept that into our own heart and life, then we have the promise of eternal life. And with that, we also commit our life to him to live for him. You see, this is what this table is all about. That's what we lift up before the Lord. We're remembering the great work that God has done and what he's completed. And if, if you have never accepted Christ, this is nothing but a cracker and some, cr and some juice to you. And by the way, bad crackers too. It's, you know, they're, they're, not the, they're not the tastiest of saltines. And that's, I think, a good thing because it really shouldn't be something that is really pleasurable to us because it wasn't to him. But he did it because of his incredible love. And what does that mean? That means that if you don't know Christ, then taking of these things means nothing to you. But you know what? It doesn't mean that you can't know Christ. You can. You can give your heart and life to Christ right now. You can ask him to forgive you for your sins. And then when you do, then this becomes meaningful because he will tell them, he says, look, I want you to take this bread and I want you to break it. This is my body which is broken for you. It's what the sins of the world were placed upon was upon him. Your iniquity, my iniquity, we're all sinners. For all of our sin, he died. And all you have to do is acknowledge that before God right now and tell him, yep, I know I'm a sinner. I need a Savior. It doesn't have to be some big emotional thing. We're not going to, you know, strike up the band and do all that kind of stuff if you decide for Christ right now. But we are going to rejoice with you, as will the angels in heaven as we are told according to the scriptures. So with everybody's eyes open right now, everybody's looking, and I'm not doing this to embarrass anyone, but I'm saying this, that every person that Jesus called, he called publicly. And if you want Christ in your heart today, you know that you need a Savior, and you want to do that right now, lift up your hand, and I will pray with you to receive Christ. Anybody at all this morning? Anybody at all? All right, let's celebrate the Lord. He tells us in verse 26, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and broke it and he gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. So Father, we take the bread. It's already broken. It's one, one little piece of matzah, one big piece of matzah, Lord, that we're all sharing. And Lord, in the Eastern culture, they believe that when they ate together, they became one with one another. This also symbolizes our becoming one with you as we take of your body, which this bread symbolizes. 
So, Lord, take it. Minister to our hearts and our life today. Fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit. I pray, God, that as we take of this, that you would bless our communion with you and with one another. And, Lord, we thank you for the bread. We lift it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Somebody snuck a saltine in there. And as, uh, then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood for the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So Father, we thank you for the blood and we thank you for what it symbolizes, that remission, the washing away, the cleansing of our sins, Lord. Not just for today, but for always. Lord, help us to be mindful that as we walk through this world and in this life that we can come at any time to receive the cleansing, the refreshing, the renewing that comes through applying the blood to my life, Lord, to my sins, that you will forgive. Lord, not only do you forgive, but you forget. Help me to be mindful of that and to repent genuinely in my heart. Turn away from the sins of my life. Help me to follow you every day of my life. Help us to follow you every day of our life. Lord, we thank you for this cup, and we lift it before you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Well, would you stand with me, please? And let me just say that it is chili time. Charlie's going to do something.